Welcome to the Rocky Mountain Audio Fest. My name is John Atkinson. I'm the editor of Stereophile magazine. And um, a few weeks back, we ran a poll on our website asking, about, asking our readers about what they felt about the advent of computers as a high-end audio source. And the result was overwhelmingly that, yes, this is a hot topic. This is something people are interested in. This is people something they're already doing, migrating their music collections to hard drives. Um, as always, Pareto's rule applied. It was an 80-20 split. The remaining 20% hated it, was going to cancel their subscriptions, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So, but 80%, the majority felt this was a really important topic, and we have been covering more in the magazine. And for this morning, we've gathered together a panel of experts in the application of computers to high-end audio. And we will be, they will be giving short presentations on their th current thinking. And then we will open the floor open for questions. So hopefully, if you have problems or need advice, they will be able to help. Um, I'll introduce everybody. On my right, your left, is John Reichbach. Jonathan Reichbach is the principal engineer at Sonic Studio LLC. And in fact, for those of you who are old like me, Sonic Studio was originally called Sonic Solutions and was a pioneer in the applications of computer to audio. I did all my first editing on the Sterify recordings in 1993 on a Sonic system, and it was the very first system that would give you full 24-bit resolution in the handling of the audio data. Um, in 1975, John wrote his first program using a language called Music 4 to generate the music for a Bach II two-part invention. While earning an MS at US UCSB, he developed Soundworks, the first network-based audio system. This led to Sonic Solutions, where Jonathan became director of engineering, followed by startups in the audio and security field. John continues to develop audio software for the professional market and home. OK, um, to John's right is John Stronzer. Just call up his bio. John Stronzer is the founder, CEO, and designer of Bel Canto Design, LLC, a manufacturer of award-winning analog and digital source components and amplifiers for home and professional applications since 2000. John began his career as a research scientist at Honeywell in 1986, specialists in uh, Gallium arsenide integrated circuit development for communication systems for defense and aerospace. He went on to become principal engineer at the AM. AM oh, computer, wake up. Computer went to sleep just as I was reading. At the AMCC <laughs> Minneapolis Design Center, developing ultra high speed um, silicon germanium and CMOS integrated circuits for fiber optic internet infrastructure communications. John has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Minnesota Institute of Technology and has been awarded seven US patents in integrated circuit design. In the center is Rob Robinson. Besides being an audiophile and dedicated music lover, Rob Robinson was a research scientist and project manager at Bell Communications Research, originally part of AT&T Bill Labs in uh, New Jersey. Included among Rob's achievements, there was, where there was designing and building one of the world's first electrochemical scanning tunneling microscopes, which he used to advance battery research for examining the structure of matter at the atomic level in the early days of what is now known, now known as nanotechnology. Dr. Robinson has been responsible for product creation at Channel D, where, which um, markets uh, pure vinyl and pure music programs since 1996. Um, to Rob's right is Ali Dixon, Ali Dixon co-founded Exmos in 2005 following work on processor architecture as an undergraduate and postgraduate at the University of Bristol, England. Since developing processor architecture, Ali has been involved in numerous Exmos application projects ranging from audio to imaging and industrial applications. Ali now works with Exmos's US customer base, helping them utilize Exmos solutions for a wide range of products. And Ali was somebody that I was, I had not heard of his work before, but everybody told me this was somebody we had to have on this panel this morning. And then finally, on the my far right, your far left, is Gordon Rankin. Gordon is the uh, 
head honcho at Wavelength Audio. He's a lifelong musician. His journey to his work in computer audio began with studying audio design. At the time, finding a job in the field was impossible. His search landed him a job in computer communications, which eventually led to the creation of Wavelength Audio based in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, Gordon, his, Gordon's code he wrote for asynchronous USB transmission has been licensed to Air and Halide, and is, um, it's cool stuff. So without further ado, I'll ask John Reichbach for five minutes on what's on his mind vis-a-vis -vis computer and audios. Can I just close it? Yes. I don't want to touch your computer. No, <laughs> uh, good morning. My name's John Reichbach from Sonic Studio. I thought today, since we're talking about computer advances, that perhaps I'd talk about how computer advances have affected us in the professional audio world over the last 25 years or so. And uh, it might show us a little bit about what we're facing today in the home world. Um, if we look at the uh, audio production chain for professional audio, you can kind of break it into four pieces. The first one could be the recording, where you put some artists in a room with a recording engineer and a microphone, and you hit the record button. Um, 20 years ago or so, that would be done to a tape. Nowadays, it's all done to a hard disk. Um, after you take the recording, it's time to actually do something with it. You go into a studio for post-production. And in post-production, you would take the sound, edit it, mix it, as John was saying, to produce a version or a final version that could be then prepared for release. Um, the distribution is the last, the next step, which is where you take the music and get it ready for release. And in the old days, distribution meant the record company, as they controlled it all. Uh, nowadays, it means what's left of the record companies. Um, the internet, your neighbor next door, stuff like that. It's everybody. Um, the last step of what you might call the production chain is actually us going out, buying some music, bringing it home, putting it on our systems, and actually listening to it. Because uh, to be honest, that's what it's all about. Um, as we've now been doing audio in the professional world for about 25 years, I thought it was kind of interesting if I would actually ask some of our customers and stuff what they thought about computers and how it's affected their jobs, how it affected the sound and their careers. So I actually went around and just started asking them. And before I get started, I will say the number one overriding comment that I got from most engineers with the advances of computer audio was they got paid less. That was number one, okay? <laughs> and, but this all started, let's say, in the late 80s when some manufacturer walked into a studio and told the guy, you need to buy this new fancy digital thing because it's faster, sounds better, and you can charge more money to your customers. Um, so the recording engineer bought that story went out and bought the digital recording console and started using it in what took two weeks, now took three and a half weeks. And uh, the reason it took so much longer is because with the expanded technology, you had new possibilities, and new possibilities means everything took longer. Um, the problem, though, with these early digital machines back in the 80s is they actually didn't sound all that great. You know, back then, we were dealing with 14-bit resolution, 32K sample rates, stuff like that. So to be honest, it was really quite a mess and it didn't sound all that good. And as anyone who's listened to some early CDs, they probably attest to that. Um, the other thing though is these machines and were very, very expensive. In 1989, I think my first disk drive for 750 megabytes was $10,000. The software that we used to sell in 1989 was $125,000. So today, 25 or so years later, we're about one half of 1% of those costs. So that's pretty good, and that's also why probably engineers get paid less. Um, but because of things getting cheaper, what happened is everyone started to do it themselves. You know, everyone bought a little workstation, put it in their living room, and started producing records. And the problem, though, is um, they didn't really know what they were doing. So for example, we all hear about the loudness wars of how people have to make their music louder. The other problem is they didn't really have the proper tools. They were basically going out and getting whatever they could. So the music wasn't recorded all that well. And probably the biggest thing is, since they were kind of doing this in their living room, they didn't have anyone else sitting with them telling them that what they were doing actually didn't sound all that great. So the music actually suffered quite a bit. And I think we're still in the process of trying to sort that out to this day, meaning people are producing music in their homes without necessarily the proper skill set. And so popular music would be a good example of where we're seeing some of those effects. Um, 
But you know, after you're done doing the recording, and after they spent their three and a half weeks, they needed to get the music ready for release. They would bring it to a mastering engineer whose job was to edit it for spacing. If it was a vinyl record, he'd apply RIIA. If it was a CD, get the bit resolution correct. Now, of course, it's the internet, so they have to publish it for iTunes. Um, the real fact is, since about the late 80s, early 90s, the overwhelming majority of the music you listen to is digitally sourced. Even most of the vinyl pressings that are done today are still sourced from a digital workstation. Um, of course, the mastering engineer is the guy that gets this ready for release, and he's at the mercy, basically, of what he's given. And if he's given music that doesn't sound that good, that's what basically comes out the other end. So we had a little contest this year with some of our customers and actually asked them to give us their comments on what they thought about computer music and how it's affected their jobs. And um, what we got back, actually, was what we call mastering haiku. And we got up easily 150 of these responses. And I thought I would just read just a couple of them. So this is kind of what the mastering engineers have thought about the current state of the art and the current music they're dealing with. Um, I'll just read three of them. A quick flash of silver, a glimpse of an IMAX flight, the computer crashed again. <laughs> <laughs> I told them it sucks, but they still want it louder. My ears are bleeding. <laughs> and man, I love my job. People pay me to listen to music all day, <laughs> which is the best one. So, you know, the last phase of the production chain is actually us in our living rooms. In some ways, we're all like mastering engineers. We want the best sound, we want the best equipment, because it brings joy to our lives. And in fact, you know, sitting here in the listening, we are the last link in the chain from the recording musician all the way into our homes. And that link is actually getting a lot closer. Um, with computer downloads and network speeds and higher resolutions, we are now listening to the same resolution music that's done in the studios. So that's actually the benefit of what we're up to. And I think soon we'll see that we're going to have all the convenience, and it's going to sound really, really good. Thanks. Thank you. To my, thank you, John. To my shame, I forgot to mention when, in his biography that, of course, Sonic Studio is, the, is also marketing the Amara front end for iTunes, which I think 2.1 has been released at this show two weeks ago. And, um, Anyway, so John Stronser from Bel, from Bel Canto, your thoughts? Uh, yes, um, I'm going to go a little less than five minutes, I think. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, as John said, the computer has taken over audio, essentially, for the most part. Um, or, and really, at, the, at root, that means audio has become a digital event. And what I've seen evolving in the last 10 to 15 years is the the quality of the A to D converters and the D to A converters that actually allow digital audio to become a very viable high-end solution. Um, once you get, I mean, actually, the, the converters we're using today are achieving close to a true 23-bit resolution, which means noise floors close to 130 dB down, better than the best analog preamplifiers you can get, and certainly enough to capture the complete dynamic range uh, that could be ever reproduced in, in the home environment, certainly. Um, and with that evolution of the quality of the converters uh, has become, we, we're, we're seeing delivery of higher resolution material, 2482, 2496, even some 24192 and 176, uh, HD tracks, all of these sources for high resolution audio are becoming more and more important. Um, I started working with computers to deliver audio in my home system, uh, I don't know, I was trying to remember how long ago it's been. <laughs> I think it's at least six or seven years. And back then when I started, I was using some pretty stock USB chips from TI, which had pretty bad jitter, limited to 1644 one, 1648. Um, it was interesting, but still go back to my LPs or CDs for listening to real music. Uh, as things have evolved, uh, the USB interfaces have gotten much better, thanks to people like Gordon, among others. Um, the jitter filtration or rejection at the D2A conversion has gotten much better, so that now I can even stream audio wirelessly on, a, on an airport express, which used to be unlistenable, 
on our current DACs and actually enjoy the music and get something out of it. And even, even MP3s start to sound better when you apply that audiophile philosophy of cleaning things up to the, to, to the maximum, getting rid of the jitter, getting rid of the noise. Even an MP3, while not sounding like pure or like full resolution CD or certainly not like high res music, MP3s start to become viable, at least to experience music at some level, maybe discover some new music, and then go after the higher resolution material to listen to it again. And then if you look around the show, at least for us, uh, Andrew Jones and I, we're, we go, the go-to source for shows is now the computer. We can bring thousands of songs with us to these shows and make the shows much more interesting and enjoyable. So the computer is uh, gaining strength year by year in the true high-end market, and I don't see it stopping anytime soon. Thank you, John. Yeah, so the computer has become a source, but not without some pain, I would imagine, Rob. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm going to word things a little bit more strongly than John. Uh, I think, you know, when people think about advances in computer audio, the first thing that comes to mind is advances in technology, advances in the hardware boxes, and so forth, that you can buy at shows like this. Um, what's happening here, what's happened by now, or is going to happen very soon if it hasn't happened by now, is that computer audio is going to make everything on the low signal side of the power amplifiers obsolete. All the transports, all the preamplifiers, because now you have the capability with analog like 192, 24, and probably higher sample rates coming even later, of having a virtual switching uh, preamplifier. So even line preamplifiers are going to go, you know, they're going to be gone. Um, now, I actually did that in 2000 on my system, uh, when, uh, in my home system, with uh, RME's uh, ADI-ATS, which was 96-24, eight in, eight out channels. So I replaced all my analog e electronic switching and everything, and even used one for home theater and wrote a little AC3 decoder so I could use that for surround. And I, I don't use surround anymore, but I just, I ran the LFE channel to shakers on, this, on the couch to give people a little thrill, but that, that's about it. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so for me, the idea of like advances in technology and that sort of thing isn't an advance as far as I'm concerned, but I can say that everybody in this room that is starting to get into computer audio uh, is extremely, extremely, extremely fortunate because now you have the benefit of all this stuff and all this debugging that's already happened and products coming to market and now you can reap the benefits of all this stuff without having to go through all this nitty gritty little things that I had to do, booting computers and things to run the system, but it was worth it for me. So what do you mean, what do I mean advances in computer audio then? Um, one of the questions that we get very often is you've got these different things, different application programs that run on computers to play audio. Why does one sound better than, you know, better than this? Why does one sound better than iTunes or seem to sound better? And so what I want to talk about is advances in terms of our knowledge as to why this is true. Um, and coming from more of an analog background, but somewhat of a digital convert, I was firmly in the camp of this, this saying, bits is bits, you know? How can you mess up digital? Because it either works or it doesn't. Um, and in about 2002, my company took on this risky project, which was developing this thing, which ended up being something called pure vinyl. And this was when uh, vinyl was still in a decline, so you can see how risky this was. It was a bootleg project, basically. Uh, and what inspired it was the uh, introduction of this product called the Lynx 2 by this company called Lynx, uh, Lynx, uh, Lynx Studio. And it was one of the first inexpensive products that did 192.24 and made this whole thing of RIAA equalization and software possible. So it, it was kind of a skunk horse project that we introduced in 2006. Now, it was four years in development, and of course the question that we had to ask was, did it sound good? Well, of course we thought it sounded good, but um, you know, the creator of a product is the least qualified to accurately evaluate a subjective property like, like sound quality, because you're not psychologically disposed to do it. Naturally, you're gonna say it, it sounds good. You know, even anybody that creates something, you know, an artist that creates a painting, unless they're crazy, is gonna think, this has gotta be pretty good compared to what else is out there before they introduce it to the world, right? So it's up to the public to decide, 
is this better or not? Uh, so the product was introduced and we got some feedback from people and saying, you know, this sounds good and, and so forth. And then we put a new user interface on it to play uh, tracks from iTunes a little bit more easy, easily and more accessibly. And all of a sudden, we get, there's all this buzz about, wow, the sound quality is so great. The sound quality is so great. And I, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, how can that be? I mean, bits are bits, you know. And your reaction on hearing me say something like that should probably be something like, it must have been an accident, right? That, you know, they just happened into this. But it turns out the truth is it wasn't an accident, and, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, <clears throat> um, there was a clue that came out, and again, asking myself for this a long period of time, a clue came out on an internet forum. Uh, someone had a problem. Their analog, their uh, digital interface to their DAC was being disrupted by uh, when their refrigerator turned on, okay? The sound would go away for a second, and then it would come back. And I, I said, aha, uh, this is a clue, because here you've got something that's bits as bits, that suddenly is being disrupted by something, some outside influence. It shouldn't happen. So that's more than a clue. It's actually what you call a boundary condition. A boundary condition is a set of parameters that describe a series of behaviors of a system in between. And of course, the other boundary condition is bits is bits, and nothing can hurt the digital. And here's the other boundary condition, which is this guy's having problems with his digital interface because the refrigerator is coming on. So, but, you know, this says that there has to be a continuum of different s situations in between where you can have a subtle degradation of the quality without this complete disruption, but it can be something that's audible. Well, what does this have to do with software? Um, I just want to just give you a little perspective on software development process. There's two types of software that, at least in my mind, software development. One type is application software. And developing application software, it's kind of like, it's kind of like traveling across the Great Plains, you know? It's sort of like driving across Kansas where uh, it's tedious as hell and, and you know that it's going to take you eight hours to, to do this, a really long time. But you know also that pretty much once you leave Missouri, you're going to get to Colorado without any incident, you know, provided that, I mean, you can't fall asleep, you know, you can't, you have to pay attention. If a car wanders onto the freeway, you know, you want to avoid those, or tumbleweeds, you know, they'll scratch your car, or maybe a tornado, you know, trying to drop a car on your house or something, you know. But, but you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get to your destination writing application software. There's very little risk. There's another class of software that kind of strikes terror into the heart of programmers, and that's driver level code. If application software is like driving across Kansas, driver level code is like facing up to Mount Everest. A much shorter different distance to travel, but you're never really sure if you're going to get to the destination, and you're never really sure if you're actually what, what's going to happen along the way, because there's lots of things that can go wrong. <clears throat> And writing driver level software is like <clears throat> staring for 30 days at 100 lines of code on the computer screen, making little touch-ups and optimizations. And the key here is trying to get the processor to, to feed you data, which is, in this case would be audio, in the optimum way, and feed the processor data in the optimum way. Uh, just to give you some perspective, in 1987, uh, I had to write, I had to develop some hardware devices and also write driver level code. And this was actually on a Mac 2 with a 32 megahertz processor, which is uh, not accounting for advances in processor design, 100 times slower than what you can buy today, and probably more like 1,000 to 10,000 times slower if you take into account all the advances. Uh, the state of the art in acquisition of signals, which you could call audio back then, was sort of 12 bits and 100 kilohertz. So this driver had to look at the state of the system every 10 microseconds and make a decision based upon this input what it was going to do next. And in driver level code, not only could you have the computer crash, but what could go wrong is that you could also cause hardware damage. And the thing that you learn is that CPUs don't like to have data delivered in bursts and little uh, pulses because there's, there's pipelines that have to be filled with data and continuously filled and emptied. They like flow, they like flow. And as inspiration for that, a couple of years before, there was a film that came out called Koyaanisqatsi, which has these beautiful, beautiful images of uh, 
time-lapse photography of natural processes and human behavior. And two scenes from that were really evocative here. One was um, images of blood cells flowing through capillaries. And the thing that was really remarkable about that was that you see how these blood cells are able to travel through these capillaries unobstructed, very smoothly flowing, even though they, they basically had to tuck their shoulders in to get through. But there was no jerkiness or uh, uh, inconsistency to this motion. On the other hand, there was another image which was taken from a skyscraper of traffic moving down Fifth Avenue in New York City. And you could see the motion which was uh, racing to a traffic light, stopping, racing to a traffic light, and stopping, and so forth. And you could just see the inefficiency in this operation. As anybody knows, when you're caught in stop and go traffic on the freeway, that is inefficient. It's much better to go 25 miles an hour than to go uh, 40 miles an hour and stop 40, and so forth. So different families of CPUs have different ways they like to have this data stream to them. And fortunately, you know, I've had the perspective of seeing these different families of CPUs and the way the pipelines need to be filled and so forth. Okay, so what does this have to do with why computer audio, some of it's, uh, why it seems to sound better than some, there's differences in the audio quality. It gets back to this idea of the boundary condition and that there's a continuum of different states. And obviously what was happening in this case with the refrigerator is that it was disrupting probably the ground reference on the, uh, the spot of digital interface and causing a real disruption. But you can have small dis dis disruptions in the ground causing increases in jitter and so forth. And if you go back now to the computer and uh, smoothly flowing code tends to cause a steady state draw on the power supply. And this is, this is one source of, of these differences. Whereas this, this burst uh, type of behavior would cause uh, pulses in the supply demand and, and changes in the jitter behavior of the interface. So basically what you want to do and what, what was done in developing these products and why people were saying, wow, this sounds great, it wasn't accidental, but it was just engineering it with this idea of um, um, driver level code design and smoothness of operation and looking and optimizing at every step of the way and getting things working smoothly. So um, that's about all I have to say. And hopefully this gives you some perspective on some of the reasons for differences in different audio software. And most importantly, why it all seems to work as well as it does. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. So, Ali, we're getting kind of deep into computer architecture here. We, we are a little bit deep, I think. Um, well, firstly, for those of you that haven't heard about Exmos, um, Exmos is a semiconductor company. Um, and we have a range of, or family of reconfigurable processors, which, as it turns out, are pretty good for doing audio. And we got involved in audio um, largely at a time where standards are changing and, and new things are, are emerging because of some of the benefits that our technology has. And, and what we've seen over the past couple of years is, is um, the move, particularly in USB, from what was full speed USB, which supports kind of 48, 16-bit, um, up to people wanting to do the higher sample frequencies, 96, 192, and, and obviously beyond there as well. And emerging standards or new standards for USB to support those sample frequencies have have led to um, those things now becoming available, um, viable, and reliable. So we've seen now um, with Mac, they have native support for, for 192, so that's certainly driving, um, or we're seeing it driving those technologies into uh, um, a lot of audio products, obviously starting at the higher end, and we're, and we're certainly seeing that move down to, uh, to consumer level products now supporting those, those types of sample frequencies. Um, Windows, as usual, are, um, a little bit behind, um, so we're working with driver vendors there to make sure that the, the same solutions that you can have for Mac are available on uh, on Windows. So we're working with Centrance, Michael's right here, and uh, and Thesicon to to make sure that um, both Windows and Mac are supported. Um, I think some of the other uh, other things that we're going to see and that we're, we're starting to see now are are the different ways that people want to use their music, the where they want to store it, how they want to move it around. So certainly things. Um, uh, wireless obviously is, is becoming pr a pretty big thing and, and people don't want to have lots of cabling around their house to move audio around. 
that's uh, certainly an interesting technology, I think, that's going to change the way that we, that we use music. You know, we all have an iPhone in our pockets and, and we have music on there and we want to just send it to a speaker in the corner of the room without having to wire it up. Um, other things that we're seeing are, are uh, wired solutions, so um, DLNA, AVB, of which uh, Exmos is a part of the Avenue Alliance. We're certainly seeing those technologies coming and, um, and people using those for, for real-world applications uh, and building products around them. So I think that w over the next few years, we are going to see a, you know, a, a change in the way people want to store their music, and we've, we've certainly seen that already. Um, so it's going to be a, an interesting time, I think. That's it from me. Thank you, Ali. So, so, Gordon, we've examined the front end, we've examined the computer, we've examined the back end from John talking about D2As and the high resolution you can now get. It, but we still have to get the data from the computer to the outside world, and you've done a lot of work on that. <laughs> okay. John just took away everything I was going <laughs> to um, Get, getting the information off the computer it, is now becoming a lot easier. You know, as Ali said, you know, there's now mechanisms for 24-192 and, and beyond. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the nice thing is, is that we're seeing that such an acceptance in this technology, as John said originally with the 80% uh, of his, you know, people responding that they are using computer audio as their main source of interface to their collection. And one of the biggest things that people tell me is that, you know, they've got this huge collection, and as we all know, we only listen to like 20 CDs. You know, that, that's it. Our favorite combination of stuff. It might not even be audiophile stuff. But one of the nicest things is, is if you put it on shuffle, and then all of a sudden, you're pulling out your iPhone. Who is that? You know? Who is that that's, on my, that's playing through my stereo right now? And I think this is the biggest impact the computer audio has on the individual, is the amount of music that people are listening to is so much greater than it used to be before. Um, there is just a full library full of music now and the availability of getting you know not only the the low res the high res and medium res there's everything and i think this is where the record industry needs to be focused and i'm on a couple of mail lists now for um, mastering engineers because they're confused you know they they talk to the musicians the musicians don't really talk to the public that much. I mean, sure, they give concerts and things like that, but they really don't know or can even see where their music is going. And this is the same way with the mastering engineers. So they're very confused as to where the market is going. And hopefully, you know, some of, some of the software developers on the Mac and the PC side and, you know, some of us as hardware engineers can can help them out because we know what the public is doing and using on our product as far as getting the music out to the speakers. Um, I have a question. How many of you are still using CD transports? Why? <laughs> I, hope, I hope next year at this time that it's half as many because there's really no reason that any of you should have a transport these days. And I'm sorry if there's hardware engineers that are selling <laughs> new products at the show that have a CD transport that, that they want to sell, but really, a, a computer can read a CD way better than any transport can. I mean, there is an upper tier of transports that read just like a computer does, but really, there is no reason to have a transport anymore. You know, go ahead and sell those and go out and buy more music or... Yeah, I mean, yeah. if I write an iMac, it could be a great... Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or a Mac Mini. Yeah, Mac yeah. Mini. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's what I try to tell my sales guys. They still say we need a cheap transport. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for, you can't rip SACDs. So if you have an SACD collection, you still have to use a, a legacy player. But, but the... But the, the thing is, is 
Okay, SACD and DVD was a total mistake. <laughs> because <laughs> so Sony and Philips wanted to make money, yeah. you know? And, and at least now we have a direction where we can, you know, we can take any resolution of a file, and even if your converter doesn't do it, the computer knows what it is, and it knows where it has to go, and therefore it can convert it to whatever you want to do. And I think what we'll see as far as the huge DSD collection is some way to convert that. You know, uh, I know Korg, I have a Korg DSD recorder. It's extremely nice and I use it for recording things. And it's got a great application for converting DSD to PCM so you can convert it to an AIFF file or a FLAC file or something like that. And I think in the future that's probably where that's going to go. So. Okay. Ali commented on something which, um, and Rob commented on something about the, no, it, I'm having a brain, brain melt here. <laughs> it was commented on by someone about <laughs> Windows lagging behind the Mac when it comes to handling audio, and it was Ali. And how do you guys deal with that, having to deal with two platforms at different stages in development and commitment to audio handling? Or, d or don't you do it? You just commit to one and not the other? So right now our USB, our USB interface, while limited to 2496, will work natively with either yeah. transparently. And frankly, we right now I view 2492 is nice, but there's very little nice. Oh, sorry. Here, here. Sorry about that. Our, the way we're dealing with that right now is uh, our USB interface, while it's limited to 2496, will work with native drivers on both platforms. And for the future, I'm not sure where we're going to go. I'm examining Ethernet, DLNA, UPnP, all of that. That can go up higher also. Okay. But well, well, I mean, John and Rob, one of the things... I wanted to hear Ali's answer to that question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. Um, so, yeah, as I said, you know, there is native support in, in Mac for Audio Class 2, which supports you know, the higher sample frequencies. Um, and um, right now, today, Windows doesn't have that. Um, certainly, I think it... Can you hear? No? Yes, you can? Yeah. <laughs> I'll try and. Go American. Yeah. <laughs> this is the Queen's English. <laughs> um, so, so for, for Windows, um, I think certainly, you know, it's helpful for everyone that wants it. Go shout about it on the forums and. and you know, that's how things happen, right? People have to demand that it, that it gets there. In the meantime, as I said, you know, working with, uh, with partners to develop drivers so that, and make those available to, to the consumer so that they can get a product that um, supports 192 24-bit asynchronous and install a driver that allows them to play that from, you know, whatever machine, whatever Windows machine that they have. Yeah, I asked a question because one of, to me, as an end user, it seems the most obvious thing, which is the bits which are on the CD, which you ripped your hard drive, which then are sent out to your DAC. Why would there be any change in those bits? But that isn't necessarily the case. You know, it's, you know, something happens to those bits, even if you, on their way out of the computer. What is it? Why is the computer messing with them? John? The reason is, is uh, computers are digital, but we're analog. We live in an analog world with power supplies and refrigerators. And what we have learned, just like Rob said, is that everything in the listening environment can work its way back up to the computer. Yes, bits are bits, but you and I don't listen to bits. Yeah, but it's well, the, di well, the thing is they're different bits. Well, that, that, that can know? occur. I mean, it, They can be different bits. Yeah, that's, that, is a, that is a real trap in the computer. I, like iTunes is notorious for this. Um, iTunes will not, it will not play necessarily the native bit rate of what you have stored. So, um, and their sample rate converter, their software sample rate converter is horrendous. It robs the music of all its inner definition and dynamics and it's just, it's terrible. It's like bad jitter basically. So, But, but is that a, f that's, they may, obviously they did that for a reason. I think they did, they did it for, they did it, I think, for ease of use for the end user, so the end user didn't have to think about having a DAC that could support 2496 or anything like that. I think that's where it's coming from. They, they view it as simplifying the solution. Okay. 
and Rob has a solution for that on iTunes, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's true, but uh, it, it's more a, a question of um, I don't know if I could, if you could call it dogma on Apple's part on their instructions to the application developers is that you know you shall not change the sample rate between behind the back of the user or behind the back of another application. And so this is breaking a rule, really. And they're only following their own rules for iTunes, you know, which is it's kind of a surprise because often they break their own rules. But in this case, they're following it. And so uh, it, is, it does lead to more complexity in the system because you do have to take care that you know, you're not pulling the rug out from something else on the system. And so it's risky. But as long as the user recognizes those risks, uh, then, then you do have this benefit of improved sound quality. And John, again, uh, I, I think that when, when you come to talk about um, bits not being bits anymore, it, it really comes down to the fact that when you're playing them from the computer, you're, you're doing a real-time process, and there, there are so many things that have to happen in concert for that to come off properly. But as far as transferring bits, it doesn't really okay. matter that much. Then bits are really bits. Yeah, but I mean, Gordon said, why does everyone still need to use a disk transport when you can have a computer? The point is, the disk transport, is ap the, the CD player is absolutely reliably going to play the bits that are on the disk. It's an appliance in that sense. Computer is not yet an appliance where you can just turn it on, call up a playlist, and press play. And I think that, that's the biggest conceptual problem that certainly my readers are facing. I just agree with that too. Yeah, John said it's also the challenge manufacturers are, are facing. And I, I, it, this came up in last year's conference that you, you can't just press play with a computer. Oh, John, come on. <laughs> after, after the, the thing about the computer is, is once it's set up, you can press play. You know, and there are emerging technologies, you know, from John and Rob and on the PC side, you know, J River and, you know, a number of applications that do allow you to do this, where, you know, you'll run 44.1 stuff and then 24.96, 24.192, and, you know, it can bounce around to all different types of sample rates, and, mm -hmm. and it'll work just fine, and it will play. And obviously, you know, if you get have a CD transport, it is only going to do one thing. and But it's not going to do it great, because a CD transport does not have flow control unless it changes the clock. And when it changes the clock, that presents jitter out to the music. And a computer, since it's got Buku memory, you know, it can load the whole song into memory if it wanted to and start streaming. And it never has to really rely on that because the interface between the DAC or the SPDIF interface or whatever, we can control that asynchronously so that the master clock is a stable, fixed entity. And that's why I still think it's better. Yeah, I mean, I think until recently, it's just using a computer has, has meant too much getting involved with your inner geek to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> but with the solutions that There's John no is... There's here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the solutions that John is offering and Rob is offering and others, now that maybe that time has passed. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? You, sir. Right. The last two I've 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 done those measurements. I don't know if any of the panel have. I mean, there are um, uncorrected errors off a good quality, a good condition CD are really rare. Maybe one per disc. So the bits coming off the trans the transport are 99.9999999 percent the correct bits. But as Gordon said, the timing of those bits is not going to be necessarily perfect. Yes, yeah. If the CD is damaged, scratched, or dirty, then that, that yeah. can definitely go up. And that's where a computer can go back and reread, you know, until it, it gets the correct or 
you know. Yeah. Back in the day when I was using um, the Sonic, Sonic Solutions system to master, edit and master CDs, when I got the reference pressing back from the plant, I would play it on a transport into the Sonic Solutions, which is running on an Apple computer, and then I could compare the two files on a bit by bit by bit level, and they always did null perfectly meaning the bits on the disk that the transport was playing were the same as the bits on the original file from which the CD had been cut. But, John, one thing about that, uh, and this is something that uh, one of my users pointed out, you know, if you rip a CD in iTunes, it'll actually tell you the bit rate that it's reading it at. You know, some are, uh, let's say we have a 24x CD drive. You know, sometimes you'll see it, you know, like Coldplay the other day, I ripped one of their CDs and it was like 20, 22. And I think that disc was really, must have been really well made. But I also ripped like an old Steely Dan CD from back in the 80s, and it was like four or five. And I really think that if you played the Steely Dan CD, on a really good transport and then played it off the computer, that the computer would sound better. Because I think the transport was having problems. Even mm -hmm. though I even looked at the CD and it was perfectly clean and you know hardly ever used, but it just ripped really slow. And I think that was the quality of the CD. Okay. Yeah, and actually, um, you know, what you don't want to do is have a computer and use the CD-ROM or DVD-ROM or whatever drive is in it. Use that as a transport. Use that to, to retrieve the bits from the disk for later use. Put them on a hard drive, but don't ask the CD-ROM or DVD-ROM to be a transport because, it's a, you're, again, you're asking for a real-time process and you don't benefit from all the, the, the little things that can happen because you're not doing it in real time when you're transferring it to disk. If there's any errors on there, they can be reread, but doing a real-time playback, you know, then, then you have glitches in the audio. Um, so. What file format would you guys recommend CDs be ripped at? Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll speak up first. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, you read about uh, all this stuff on the internet that people can hear the difference between different file formats and so forth. And, and I think maybe this gets back to a little bit what I was saying, that uh, the dynamics of the way the stuff is read from the hard drive because the different file formats do have this, this influence on outside things because of power supply draws and things like that. So, for instance, if you compare AIFF to a lossless compressed format, and then the process of getting that back out to, the, to your, your DAC, the AIFF is already in a stream format. It's already uncompressed, and so it's matter, I mean, more a matter of just getting it into memory and getting it out. Uh, lossless compression, there's a couple of other steps that have to go before you get the data into the pipeline. But the place where it doesn't matter, and I think where you really do want to rip to a Apple lossless because of the benefits. It works better in the Apple ecosystem. Uh, the tagging is really good. The data storage requirements are smaller. If you have the data on a network storage, it takes that much less time proportional to the reduction in the file size to get it into your computer. When you load the data, the track in the memory completely, then the pedigree of the data is completely irrelevant because then it's completely decompressed in PCM. So you might as well benefit from the higher compression. Now, some people might disagree with me here, but, but that's, that's the way I look at it. Gordon, I mean, last year I listened to a demonstration you did of lossless versus the original AIF, and to my surprise, there was a difference. Yeah, I, I suggest on the PC side, you really need FLAC because AIFF and WAVE are pretty much identical. It's a flat PCM file. It's really ready, as Rob said, just to output directly. But the problem with the WAV file is it has no embedded tagging. So if you lose your hard drive or something crashes and you have all these files backed up, now there's no reference in the PC world for you to find out what all your music is. At least in FLAC, which is very similar to Apple Lossless, you have a very good tagging system. But my feeling is, is that um, with the way storage is, you know, it, it's nothing. You know, you can go out and buy a couple terabyte drive now for 120 bucks. You know, go ahead and store it in AIFF. It's always going to sound better because, as Rob said, you know, there has, there's other steps involved. Every step that you take in an application 
is going to reduce the quality of music. So if you can reduce the number of steps that it has to go through, then you're a lot better off. And so that's why I say, go ahead, save it in AIFF. Yes? Just a quick follow-up to that. You've written in a lossless format to be compressed or uncompressed. Can you then go to AIFF you without can, going back to the hard media and getting yeah, the benefits you John, John and I have done a number of tests on that. And you can convert from Apple lossless or from FLAC, you know, and it will be a bit true. And, you know, basically what you do in iTunes, you'd go into your preferences and set it to AIFF, and then you can select a number of files. And you can try this, you know, try it at home. Just select maybe one or two songs, and you go to the advanced uh, pull down and say convert to AIFF, and go ahead and listen for yourself. You know, it, it might be, the faster the computer is, and the more efficient it is, the less differential in sound that's going to happen. So, there it is. Last, some years ago, I, oh, sorry, John. I was just going to say, from our, our experience, we would say uncompressed, and I think the biggest issues for us is actually metadata support. You know, if you're on a Mac, use AIFF or Apple lossless for the metadata. Um, on PCs, you know, we recommend Broadcast Wave because it has extensive uh, capabilities for metadata also. As, as was said, that if you lose your library, you really do want the metadata in the files. The, the issues of lossless, the definition of lossless means you can go back to uncompressed. That's the definition, so you should give it a try. So about three years ago, I wrote an article for the magazine where I was talking about ripping, and I said, whatever you do, don't rip to a lossy format like um, MP4, AAC, or MP3. And I was jumped because, you know, then you are destroying the bits to some extent. And I was jumped on by some of the internet forums. Well, this is just silly because no one can hear a difference anyway. And I thought, well, no, why would you do that? Yes, it's great to, to have more songs on your iPod, but surely your original, you might as well rip at the highest resolution, the bit true resolution. So would you guys agree with that? Don't rip to lossy formats. Well, think about it like a library. You know, you wouldn't want to go into a library where somebody's ripped out every other page. You know, <laughs> you know, and now, and now there, there is the, you know, a couple of years ago in iTunes, when you plugged in your iPod, you know, you had to take your library and then I'll put it to your iPod at whatever the same file rate is. Now there is a, a box that you can check that when you plug your iPod in and download your music to your iPod, that you can put it in AAC format, which will save you room on your iPod, and that, that's a nice feature. Mm. And I have a question. You, sir. Yes. I, thank you for saying that. I, I've been saying that. I, I talk for a living. I present, and, and I've been saying that for years, and people don't get it. So I have to take them over to their computers and actually show them you can store it here, and then later on compress if you need to. But I have a couple of questions just to clarify. Did you say, I think it's Rob, that we shouldn't use the DVD ROM or CD ROM drive at all, or we can use it uh, simply to gather the bits? That's correct, yeah. Don't use it as a transport. In other words, don't use it for real time playback, right. you know, where you're, you're using it like a transport. It's not designed for that. And I'll say one other thing is that. Uh, Specifications for those drives are one thing, but the way they actually perform is another, and the specifications are determined under probably the best possible conditions. Uh, slot loading drives are not what you want to use to rip your CD collection. Uh, buy like an external drawer type mechanism, or if you have a computer with a drawer type mechanism, that's fine. Uh, even though the specs might be the same, you'll see two, three times faster uh, ripping rates to get the CDs in, and also you'll see lower error rates. If you have a few scratches on there, they can cause the, the uh, slot loading mechanism to completely freeze up sometimes, but a, tr a drawer mechanism, the precision of, the, of the, the spinning mechanism is much higher, so you're better off with that. I have a question for Gordon as well. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand why the clocking in a computer would be superior in terms of jitter reduction to the clocking in a really, really good high-end CD player. To me, it I'm not a computer geek, obviously, 
but I don't understand why that's better. Think about it this way. There, there's a flow rate with all data. This is all streaming data. So when you have a transport and it's reading the information off the drive, it has to adhere to the streaming technology. It has to, um, you know, basically change the speed of the clock in the output of data because, or speed it up depending on if the endpoint needs more information or less information. And so therefore, it is not a fixed clock. And there's, there's been a lot of technology where they've tried to slave the DAC back to the transport. And th there's all kinds of issues with all those types of technologies, uh, you know, with one of them being that, you know, at some point there, there has to be some, you know, change. And therefore, it can't be fixed. But in an asynchronous environment, where you have the DAC actually controlling the speed of the transfer from the PC, then that clock can be set. And the computer can read, you know, the files and then output or input the data at a, at a slower or faster rate. Um, and there is no jitter at that point because it is true data and not a stream. Yeah, maybe, maybe the misconception is that the clocking isn't done by the computer. The clocking is done by the DAC. Okay, the DAC, oh, okay. The, the DAC determines, the DAC pulls the data from the computer at a rate that it needs it and hopefully also internally buffers it so that if there is any small interruption, it doesn't matter because it's already got a little pool of, mem a pool of uh, audio in there that it can draw upon. So it's just the, the overall average rate that you have to be concerned about from the computer. I agree, you know, if the computer were, were setting the clock, that would be terrible, you know, but that isn't what happens. Okay. okay. Question, you, sir? Yes. Uh, I had a question for uh, Ali on the uh, comment on Mac supporting 24.196 native. Where do you see things going now that that output capability is going over the next short time frame here? Sounds like Gordon knows more about this than I do, so maybe I should pass it over to him. Uh, basically now on OS X, it's 64.384 is the maximum output. The biggest thing that we see in this year and going forward is 32. And as Dustin Foreman from ESS will tell you, um, you know, the, this is going to be the next big move is 32 bits in and out. The problem we have right now at the application level is, is that a lot of the operating systems are running at what we call a 32-bit floating point mechanism. Well, obviously, if you float a 32-bit number, it's no longer going to be bit perfect. You know, and so the good thing is, is Apple is moving to a 64-bit floating point uh, base operating system, which means that at that point, you know, we'll be able to go ahead and say, download this new firmware and, you know, go at it. Here's uh, 32 bits, so. So you're saying firm, potentially firmware adjustments to current hardware yeah. to enable that? Could I, could I ask why it's an advantage to go to 32-bit when really even the best A to D converters in the world are, you know, can only achieve maybe 20, 21, 22-bit resolution? Dustin, you want to take that one? I, I don't know. Maybe it's a little premature to ask that question because, we, you know, yeah, people were asking the same question when 24-bit came out, right? Right, right. But at least you knew that the 24-bit was close to yeah, what yeah, was, yeah. was being put on the masters. Is it because of a s signal processing you want to do, which will always end up with yeah, a 32-bit Yeah, 32 that's, that's bit true. Word? For, for instance, if you do some DSP in the software, like just speaking of my own company software, we, there's a feature where you can do real-time upsampling of Redbook CD, and all that's done at 64 bits of internal precision. So if you're streaming the data out to a DAC at 24 bits, then you have to take that 64 bits and truncate it down to 24. But if you're talking a 32-bit uh, uh, DAC, then you only have to truncate down to 32 bits. So theoretically, you have the advantage of preserving some of that extra precision that you get in the upsampler, for instance. Okay. And that's, that's actually possible to do that right now without the firmware because there's a mode that you can access in core audio that lets you actually output 32-bit uh, integer instead of 32-bit floating point. Okay. Sir? Can people comment on uh, solid-state memory versus yeah. hard drive technology? Um, 
our experience has been for almost 20 years that anything that spins in a computer can make some noise. It's really that simple. Anytime you put a spinning object inside a computer, it generates a lot of noise. So the answer is that anytime that you can get the disk, anything to stop spinning, it's going to actually sound better in your system. I think the distinction might be between SSDs nowadays, especially as uh, the software is improving, is actually taking advantage of the memory in the computer. Um, obviously, if you can load an hour's worth of music into your computer on the DRAM, it doesn't matter if your disk is, if you have a hard disk or not, it's not going to spin. So in some ways, I think SSDs uh, remove the disk drive and the noise, but I think as time goes by with more and more memory playback, I think getting more memory in your computer is probably a, a bigger win for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, question right at the back. One, one of the biggest problems we have right now at the forums is misinformation. You know, there's just way too much of it. Um, you know, the, the, the two or three that I, I use are computer audio file, uh, an audio asylum, um, you know, where I try and stay on top of both of those and, and answer as many questions as I can. Uh, but just going through the, the list and threads of what's going on, there is a lot of misinformation, uh, especially from manufacturers, about what's what's best for you. And but the big thing is, is you know, this is a new technology. Trying things is going to make you learn more about what you like and what works best for you. And uh, this is something I I really suggest people do.